Yeah, we took a little break. It's no big deal. Uh, good morning, Trinity Bible Church. It's good to be with you. If you would, start making your way to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And as you turn there, I just want to say how, how grateful I am to be here with you this morning. It's, uh, it's true, I am a junior high pastor. And honestly, as a, a middle school pastor, I can't remember the last time I preached and I didn't throw candy uh, into the audience first. So this is great. I, I'm so glad to, to be here. Some of you are looking uh, cheated and feel, feel like you didn't get candy. So I got some mints. Maybe we'll work on that afterwards. Uh, thanks to Kent and Matt. Mark, for having me grateful to open the word of our living God with you all this morning. Let me pray for us, and then we'll get into our text. Father, thank you for this morning, for your people, for your word, God, for this church. So excited to be here. I'm excited for what you're doing here in Dallas, and I pray for these people, and I pray that you would encourage them. Father, I pray that through this church, this ministry here, that you would bring many to, to salvation, that, that many would come to Christ. Pray that you'd write the eternal truths of our text this morning on our hearts, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So before I read our, our passage this morning, I am totally aware that none of us willingly start a story three-fourths of the way through. Um, we don't buy a bestseller and, and open to chapter 12 thinking, I'll just start here. Um, none of us, you know, rent a movie or get a movie and fast-forward half of it thinking, you know, this is a good place to start. No, we, we want to be in the know. We want to know what's going on right from the very beginning. And here I am asking you to open to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, what sort of a cruel and heartless person am I? Well, you're about to find out. Uh, no, I, I want you to be in the know. I want you to know what's going on, and I'd like for you to, to have as much information as, as, as possible for you to, to get into this chapter in 2 Samuel 9. I'd like to take us from the Garden of Eden all the way to King David, and I think I can do it in about seven minutes. So we're going we're gonna to try. I love some of these summary words by, by Schreiner. He, he says that God created Adam and Eve, so Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, to, to rule the world for his glory, but they sinned. They were unable to live in the way that God had set for them. They could not live in a way that would be pleasing and in God's sight, and their sin led to death, and their sin brought death to all mankind. But still, God promised victory over the serpent through the offspring or through the promised seed of, of the woman. And the woman did have offspring. She had two sons, Cain and Abel, and we quickly just see the effects of sin in Genesis chapter 4 as brother kills brother seems that the serpent is winning. And the world turns to evil, and we have horrible events like the flood and the Tower of Babel to remind us of that. Genesis 8, 21 says that man's heart is only... And yet, God reigns. God always reigns. He judges, and He punishes those who have given themselves over to evil. And so we ask, where is this seed? Where is this offspring of the woman who's going to bring victory? And as the story continues, Noah rises to the surface, and then Abraham, and we see these two, and they are offspring, they are seed of the woman, and we're hopeful that maybe it's, it's one of them. And, and, and as the f story, it follows God's people, and we see God choosing Abraham. God makes this promise to Abraham. Abraham covenant. And he promises Abraham three things, to, to give the people land, and he promises to, to just give 
Abraham tons of offspring. And then that there would be this worldwide blessing through Abraham. Abraham's offspring is is highlighted in Genesis all the way to his great-grandson, Joseph. And Joseph finds favor with Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. And Joseph brings his family into that land. And through that, God saves God's people from a horrible famine. They survive. And after a while, the people of Israel find themselves in a place that they don't belong. There's a new Pharaoh in town, literally. And God's people are in slavery. Israel's found herself in a place where they're in need of deliverance, and God delivers them. He brings them from Egypt all the way to the edge of of Canaan. And there we see that the first part of that promise that God made to Abraham is fulfilled. There is a, a large amount of offspring And it looks like they're about to go into the land, so the second part of the promise appears that it's about to be fulfilled. But disaster, that wilderness generation grumbles. And they don't believe that God's plan is good. They don't embrace Yahweh's plan and power. They're afraid of the giants who occupy that land. And out of millions of people, all but two think that this is a good idea. Only two believe that God's plan is is good and God's people fail to possess the land and we have to wait now an entire generation until they're under the leadership of Joshua. And it's under his leadership that they finally follow the Lord's directive and possess the land by removing the Canaanites. God's plan, it, it was good. Israel is now a large nation and they are dwelling in the land. And it seems like all that's left is the third part of that promise that there would be worldwide blessing. But then we turn the page to Judges. We turn to the book of Judges and we see that Israel is is just in this downward spiral, spiritually speaking. It's just a, a total disaster. God's people that failed to abide by the conditions of the covenant. Again and again, they refuse to submit to Yahweh as their king. It's just a a total mess. As this book of Judges draws to a close, right before we turn to the page of Samuel, God's people are a disaster. Everything's a mess. There's corruption and dishonesty, and there's wickedness. There's immorality, there's defiance against God on every corner. And God's people are in a desperate need of a Savior. And the last words of the book of Judges is, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So without a king, we, we turn to 1 Samuel. Originally, 1 and 2 Samuel is just one book. So as we turn to the book of Samuel... Israel is is desperate for a king, and they're demanding that God give them not just any king, but a very certain type of king, a kingly-looking king. They want a king like the nations. So Saul, or God gives them exactly what they ask for. He gives them Saul. Saul was every inch a king. There was no one taller. There was no one more powerfully looking than Saul. He was impressive all the way around. No one to compete with him in the Mr. America contest. If you're into Disney films, he made Gaston look average. Uh, Mr. Incredible look like Mr. Nobody. Okay, Saul is every inch a king, but he isn't what Israel needed. Unfortunately for Israel, Saul doesn't last. He blows it as king. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul disobeys the word of the Lord. He takes matters into his own hands. And along the way, he he loses the kingship. God's quick to raise up another, a young man named David. And David comes onto the scene. And as as we read through the text, we're, we're, we're filled with hope again, hoping that David will be as good as he seems. Maybe David is this promised one that we've been waiting for. And David's been center stage since 
chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, he's killed giants. He's dodged spears. He hasn't had it easy, but he has assumed the throne in a way that was God-honoring. Through David, God's chosen king for the very first time reigns on earth. And as we get to 2 Samuel, God makes a covenant with David. Another promise by God now to David. He promises to make his name great. He promises that through David, God's people will have rest in the land, rest from their enemies all around them. And he also promises that there would be one in David's line whose reign would last forever and ever. We get a little clarity on this promised seed. That was chapter 7, the Davidic covenant. And in 2 Samuel chapter 8, that promise gets a little bit of a partial fulfillment. David's name does become great, and in every direction that the compass faces, Israel is subduing their enemies. The people do have rest. David's name is becoming greater. And now in chapter 9, Yahweh's king, David, utters these words. Verse 1. David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. They called him to David. The king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, Well, there is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. Then King David sent, and he brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, he came to David. He fell on his face, and he paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold, I am your servant. David said to him, Do not fear I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? And the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belonged to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. I promise, you have my word, Uh, I I swear I'll I'll do it. Some of those might sound familiar to you. We make a a lot of promises all the time. Uh, We make promises that we have our homework done. I see some younger folks in the crowd. We promise mom and dad that we've done our homework, that we've fed the dog, um, Husbands maybe swear that they'll take a turn doing the dishes after dinner. Promise to get to the honey-do list this weekend. We we make promises all the time. Uh, We give our word that we've already left the house 
blaming our tardiness only on the traffic, which may or may not be true. Um, we make promises. We promise to keep a secret. We even make a pinky promise. Which, by the way, pinky promise is dangerous. Uh, it's got some Japanese roots to it. It's, in their culture, believed to be the most sacred, unbreakable promise ever. In fact, what you're saying when you make a pinky promise is, look, if I don't do what I said I would do, you have every right to just whoosh, cut this pinky off. Uh, in, in Japanese, it's called uh, yubikiri. And if you don't speak Japanese, which I don't, uh, that's called the finger cut off promise. Careful. Careful. Those pinky promises. We, we make a lot of promises, and whether or not we keep that promise is something entirely different. And as we come to 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're going to see the effects of a promise. This is a promise that David made, a promise that he made to, to Jonathan 15 years ago, maybe longer. Jonathan, the, the son of Saul, but this is a promise that's kept. Uh, David, he keeps his promise. He honors the, the covenant that he made with his best friend. Through this promise that's kept and honored, we benefit. You and I gain so much from this chapter. It's, it's not a lesson about keeping your promise. It's not a, a chapter about what to do when somebody doesn't keep their promise to you. We know you just cut their pinky off. Uh, no, don't do that. But there's, there's a rich, rich lesson for us this morning as David will demonstrate for us what loyalty looks like. He shows us what it is to be faithful to a, a promise, faithful to a covenant. And in the midst of that, the kindness of, of God is on display as God's king David will demonstrate that beautifully. The kindness of God. David displays its hesed, its steadfast love, loyal love, faithful and, and loving loyalty. Kindness. And it all stems from David's desire to keep a promise. And that matters because God has made promises to us as well. God has made a covenant with us, promise of salvation, promise of, of restoration. This relationship that's broken by sin through the gospel, God promises that that relationship can be fixed, can be put back to the, the way it's supposed to be. A promise of, of kindness expressed in the gospel. And friends, if, if David, as God's agent of kindness... If he can demonstrate for us what keeping a promise looks like, then we know full well that God can, can do this so much better, so much richer, so much fuller. Great picture of the kindness we can experience in God's kingdom. That, that's a, the big idea, if, if that sort of thing's helpful for you. This is a great picture of the kindness of God that can be experienced in God's kingdom hope this encourages you and your understanding of, of the kindness that's in the gospel. I hope that this just encourages you in, in your praise of what God has done and, and the promises that God has made to you and me and it's kindness that's guaranteed because it stems from a promise. So, what does this kindness look like? I, I want to show it to you in this chapter in, in, in sort of three parts three adjectives to describe this kindness. And the first one will be unconditional kindness. And that will be in verses 1 to 4. Unconditional kindness. Promise was made in 1 Samuel chapter 20 between David and Jonathan. It was more than a decade ago. Maybe even as long as two 20 years before, Jonathan says to David, I'll read it for you in 1 Samuel 20, verse 14. He says, again, Jonathan, Saul's son, says to David, If I'm still alive, show me the steadfast love which 
By the way, it's the same word for kindness that we have here in 2 Samuel 9. Jonathan says, show me steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. He says, do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth, which, by the way, just happened in chapter 8. Jonathan says, don't cut off every, uh, every one of my house forever. And then he says, and then verse 16, Jonathan makes this covenant with the house of David, saying, may the Lord take vengeance on your enemies. And then Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, the text says, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So it's a, it's a 15-year-old promise. Does it still matter? What even prompts David to ask this question in verse 1 of 2 Samuel 9? Is there anyone left for me to show kindness to, steadfast love to in Saul's house? And I believe it's this promise that he made to his soul-knit friend that's motivating him. He's, he's remembering this, this promise that he made. There's, there's no second guessing the promise. There's no thought of, well, you know, I, I'd like to keep this promise, but it's just so complicated now. It's been so long and it's, it's too hard. I don't even know if anyone's left, left for me to show this kindness to, to, to keep this promise to. There's a number of excuses that David could make to just sweep this promise under the rug. I mean, the, the dynasty is secure now. Everything, is, everything is, is at rest and we have peace in every direction. I'm the king. I'm in. Saul's out. Why still show honor to Jonathan? Why keep this promise? David displays for us what covenant loyalty looks like, what, what faithfulness looks like. He shows us what kindness looks like. That's the word that we have here in verse 1 and in verse 3 and in verse 7. Kindness. Steadfast love. David wants to keep this promise to Jonathan. He wants to show an extraordinary act of kindness. And because his friend is dead, Jonathan is dead. David's searching for anyone in the house of Saul to show this kindness to. Is it not reasonable to think that David is responding to the kindness that God has just shown him? Chapter 7, we, we didn't get a chance to read it, but verse 15, God says, My steadfast love, kindness, will not depart from him, speaking of this one whose throne will last forever and ever, a descendant of David to come, God promises that this kindness will be on him forever. Is it not possible, is it not reasonable to think that David's just trying to show the same kindness that's been expressed to him and to his offspring? David remembers that this is for the sake of Jonathan. You see that right at the end of verse 1. Showing that he'll be a king of God who keeps his promise no matter what. Then verse 2 through 4, David summons this character named Ziba, this servant who's still connected to Saul's family, and they, they pull him in for this sort of royal interrogation. They want to know what he knows, and Apparently this man is aware of a descendant of Saul. There is still one left, Ziba informs them. It's a son. It's a son of Jonathan. And we, the reader, actually already met him back in chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 4, the author tucked in this note about Mephibosheth and the reality that he was lame and crippled in his feet. And Mephibosheth comes back to our story here in chapter 9. He's still alive. I don't want you to miss this little hidden gem in verse 3. The kindness that David wants to show this descendant. 
this, this one in the line of Jonathan, it's, it's described as the kindness of God. David has some sort of self-awareness that he is an agent of God's kindness. Um, he's God's representation of, of the kindness that's been showed to him, and it's about to be on display towards this one of Saul's line, towards Mephibosheth. Kindness of God. Ziba doesn't hesitate to give up his knowledge of Jonathan's son. There's more to come on him in future chapters. Kind of a shady guy. Just sort of gives him up. I don't know. But he only says this one thing about Mephibosheth. That he's lame in, in both his feet. Crippled. Maybe to draw out some sympathy from David. Even though we already knew about Mephibosheth and his condition, we have to remember that this is all news to David. He's just learning about this for the first time. We were told in chapter 4 that it was Mephibosheth's nurse who, when she heard that Jonathan was killed and, and then his grandfather was killed, Saul, she, she rushed out to save his life, trying to get him out of where he was. She falls and drops Mephibosheth, and he becomes lame. We already are aware of that. And, and Ziba shares that fact again. Not sure why, but one thing that's clear is this. David's looking to show kindness, and the kindness of God, and Mephibosheth is certainly one who needs it. Certainly one who's in need of kindness. This man is, is crippled. He depends on, on help with everything. Mephibosheth also, he has no knowledge of this promise between his dad and David. He's not seeking it out. He isn't manipulating David with this promise that was made. In fact, from a human standpoint, no one besides David even knows about this promise. It wouldn't be that difficult for it to just go away. But this is, this is promise keeping. This is a taste of God's loyalty, a picture of, of promise. It doesn't matter how long ago it was. It's irrelevant how much has changed since that promise was made. It's besides the point to highlight Mephibosheth's unworthiness or worthiness of such a promise. And even the conditions under which the promise were made, they can't alter the promise. David reminds us that his promise to Jonathan is an unconditional promise. This promise is unconditional. David's going to seek it out and try to fulfill it because God's kindness is at stake. David knows about this promise and that's enough. And because of who David is as God's agent of kindness, this promise will be kept. Kindness will be experienced. And when we think about the promises that God has made to us, and I hope you're already there mentally, this little uh, picture of David's kindness should bring us such great amounts of, of security and, and and comfort when we think about what God will do. God promises that those who turn from their sin and call out to Him in repentance will be saved. Period. It doesn't matter how long ago that promise was made. It's irrelevant. The, the conditions under which that promise was made it doesn't matter how unworthy or worthy you are of that promise, and we're all so unworthy of it. This is unconditional kindness of, of the gospel. Dale Ralph Davis says this, Love that truly loves is willing to bind itself. Love that truly loves is willing to promise. It's willing and gladly obligates itself so that the other may stand securely in that love. Friends, God has bound Himself to love us. 
to shower us with his kindness so that we never, ever have to worry about losing his love. Unconditional kindness in the gospel. It's comforting to know that this promise is unconditional. But there's more to say. Not only is this picture of kindness unconditional, it's also, secondly, undeserved kindness. That's our second description of it. Verses 5 to 8, undeserved kindness. It says, Then King David sent, and he brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. By the way, when you're reading Old Testament names and places, just be confident. Everybody will think you know what you're saying. It's perfect. But just be confident. Anyway, Mephibosheth comes to David. I believe he must have been so terrified. He's, he's taken away from his caregivers. Probably doesn't even put up much of a fight because of his state. I don't know if, if that day maybe he wished his feet worked more than on other days. Probably. But here he is in front of the king, summoned to the king who, who replaced his grandfather. Mephibosheth knows his history. He knows what happens to, to people like him. He knows what happens to, to, to the offspring of, of kings when a new king takes the throne. They're eliminated. This is why his nurse left in such haste when she heard that his father and grandfather had been killed. She was trying to save his, his life. And Mephibosheth knows when he goes into the presence of this king, he's expecting the guillotine. There's no way that Mephibosheth doesn't know that David just defeated the enemies that surround them in every direction. There's no way he doesn't know that hasn't heard that. David is on the war path. He's unstoppable. Obviously, it isn't difficult to think that Mephibosheth likely assumes he's next on the list. He's a descendant of the rival king. He knows what happens to guys in his position. Whoosh. You can picture him, not a big guy, not a, a burly guy, probably pale, scrawny. His life had been anything but normal. And I, I just I picture him literally just trembling before David. And this is why the text records this action for us. This is why the, the bowing, the prostrating, the, the homage... The, the proclamation of servant status before the king. Mephibosheth has no reason to expect anything but death from David. And I'm certain that the furthest thing he's anticipating is kindness. I read verses 6 and 7, and in my head I just hear kindness in the voice of David. And I wonder if, before he spoke, if he thought about how much Mephibosheth looked like his dad. Did he tear up when he saw him? Son of his best friend? I wonder if he thought he looks just like him. And he looks at this young man who's, who's literally lying on the floor in front of him, and he, he says... Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth interrupts. He responds, I'm your, I'm your servant. I bet David is interrupted not because Mephibosheth is rude, but because he's so intimidated by this situation. And David has to say it in verse 7, Don't fear. For the sake of your father, Jonathan. Verse 
7 that goes on. It's, it's the heart of the chapter. It's the centerpiece on the table at, at Sunday dinner. You can't miss it. And, and I want you to notice the, even the personal touch by the author here in verses 2 and 4. David has always been King David. King, King, King. It's annoying how many times the author uses that word King. But here in these verses, notice this interaction between David and Mephibosheth. He's just David. Hey, just call me David. Get up. I was a friend of your dad's. Come here. And then this undeserved kindness from David to Mephibosheth is is on display. In the original language, it's so much more emphatic. David says, I will absolutely, positively, surely, beyond any shadow of a doubt, show you kindness. And then he promises him this protection, this provision, this position. Three parts of this promise and kindness of David. Protection, don't fear. Provision, you're going to get your land back. Position, you're going to have a seat at my table. What relief for Mephibosheth. What an unexpected Undeserved grace. As I already said, this this promise, it has very little to do with Mephibosheth, but he's promised protection nevertheless. He's, He's promised provision in the farmlands that his grandfather had once owned. Mephibosheth will have it all restored to him. He's promised this position, this permanent seat at the table of a king, which is such a unique and privileged place that very few ever got to enjoy. And baffled, Mephibosheth questions King David, why? Why me? Why me? So insignificant, such a nobody. Why? Why me? And isn't that a fitting question? Isn't that a question that we should ask God? God, why me? Why such kindness to me? Those who have embraced the promises of God in the gospel, it's so easily identifiable here. Jesus promised protection in the gospel from the Father's wrath, protection from a deserved punishment in an eternal hell. He promises provision Matthew 19, 29, everyone who's left house and family will receive many times as much and inherit eternal life, both temporal and and eternal provision. And we've been promised position. We've been offered a seat at the table of the king, quoting Luke 13. Those who have been saved should daily ask God, Why me? But not in a spirit of doubt. A spirit of of worship. A heart full of of thankfulness and and overflowing with gratitude. God's kindness to us is unconditional and it's so undeserved. But we got to move. It's, it's also, I want to show you this third part, unlimited kindness. That's our, our third description, verses 9 to 13. Unlimited kindness. Verse 9, David doesn't appear to waste much time. I think it's the same scene. Just turns to and calls for Ziba to come back and, and puts this, this promise into action. David's answer is to put it into motion. Actions speak louder than words. Ziba, in verse 11, he commits to do all that King David has requested. We think about this request of David, and we start to realize putting Ziba in charge of the land means Mephibosheth doesn't have to do anything. But yet now for the first time probably in his whole life, he'll have a, an income. There'll be, there'll be this source of, of produce. 
verse 12 sneaks in this little line about a son of Mephibosheth named Micah. And it's, I could do a whole sermon on it. It's, it's so much more than filler. It's so significant because that son doesn't just take up a line in your Bible. It represents the line of Saul continuing on. It represents that that line is not extinguished, but will go on, which is precisely what David promised Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20. I will not cut off your family forever. This promise has come to fruition. David's faithful to his promise. And Perhaps biggest and loudest of all, we see that Mephibosheth is no longer a dog, no longer needing to beg and grovel for for scraps. The author insists that we stop looking at Mephibosheth as a servant and begin to see him as a son of the king. In verse 7 and 10 and 11 and 13, the author just keeps putting that in front of our eyes. The king's table. Mephibosheth is a son at the king's table. If we consider that promise again in 1 Samuel 20, the heart of Jonathan's request is is really just a a covenant to to stay alive. He wants his his family line to continue, and, and David keeps that promise. But David goes so above and beyond that promise. It's not just about staying alive. If that's all it was, David could have just airdropped in a monthly supply of food or whatever and just been done with it. But it's so much more. David overwhelms Mephibosheth in goodness. He just heaps kindness upon him. A downpour of grace. He doesn't just keep him alive. He, he reinstates his inheritance. He doesn't just ensure that he has life. He he welcomes him to his table for for daily bread. David doesn't just see to his survival. This is grace upon grace. Truly, this is the kindness of God that verse 3 talked about. Is that not true of the kindness of God in our own life? There's no such thing as bare minimum with God's kindness and love towards us. That's why the psalmists sing of it so often. His kindness so unlimited. Psalm 23, Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. John 6, 35, Jesus says to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Mephibosheth is the one that this This kindness, this unlimited kindness embraced for sure. So many references to Mephibosheth. You should come in. So many references to Mephibosheth here at the end of our chapter. It's it's a little awkward as we read it, isn't it? The the, the add-on stuff about Micah and moving to Jerusalem and the reminder of his... His, his lameness, his crippled state. It's almost like the author feels compelled to, to say these things and he had forgot to mention them, so he sort of just tacks them on at the end. I don't believe that's the case. I, I, I believe Mephibosheth, especially his lameness, becomes the focus again for us because we're meant to consider one more time who he was. The author doesn't want us to leave Mephibosheth before we consider just exactly again who he is, to see ourselves in the life of Mephibosheth. 
He is unmistakably lame. Verse 3, verse 13. Chapter 4, which we didn't read, but it says it there as well. He's dependent. He's crippled. He's helpless. And we can't miss the genealogy of Mephibosheth either. He is the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. Mephibosheth is the enemy. He doesn't belong. He, he deserves death. But he's spared. Helpless enemy turned friend. Helpless enemy turned family. An insane promise that was made by David in 1 Samuel, at least according to our standards, no king to be would ever make such a promise. But that promise of kindness is such shelter for Mephibosheth. It's an amazing promise of safety and security for someone who's helpless and for someone who's an enemy of the king. And that's the same kindness we have in the gospel. David's not the author of this steadfast love. He learned it from the one who created him. He learned it from, from God, from, from Yahweh. He learned it from the God who already promised him and has already shown him this same level of kindness. I hope you don't need a lot of imagination to understand that you and I are just like the son of Jonathan here. And this is the love that God has for us. This is the kindness of God towards us in the gospel. It's unconditional. It's undeserved. It's unlimited. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 5. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ dies for the ungodly, but God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Helpless enemies. Some of us feel sorry for Mephibosheth that he's helpless and that he's lame. That he's this supposed enemy of God having to come bow and, and prostrate before the king. You want to know the difference between us and Mephibosheth? I believe he's actually better off than we are. Because he, he knew where he stood before the king. He at least knew who he was. We actually think that we're okay. Such spiritual confidence in ourselves and don't need God's help here. Don't need his, his kindness here. I wanted to say that we're, we're just like Mephibosheth. Truth is, friends, we're worse. We don't fear the king. We don't see ourselves as we truly are. How good for us to learn from Mephibosheth. To take a good look in the mirror and to see our helpless state. To know that we're enemies before the king. How good to come before the king and prostrate. To fall down and worship and cry out, I am your servant. Through Christ and through him only, you and I are invited to eat at God's table. Unconditional, undeserved, unlimited kindness of God in the gospel calls all of us helpless enemies to be sons and daughters to eat with the king. Father, thank you for our time in 2 Samuel 9 this morning to see that without Christ we are still helpless, still enemies. God, and we need to embrace the kindness that you've offered in the gospel. Pray that you would use the, the, the truth and, and words of your living word, God, to help us, to grow us, to change us. 
Father, most I would pray for those who don't know you, who, who don't have a relationship with you, who, who have never confessed their sin, who have never called upon you for salvation, that, Father, you would use a text like this to save them, bring conviction into their life and heart and help them to see where they truly stand before you, the King of Kings. Grateful for this church, grateful to be here this morning. I pray, Father, that you would encourage the saints. Equip them for the work of your ministry here, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.